We will now hear House Bill 728, sponsored by Representative Billington. Representative, please proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Chairman Drayree and Vice Chair DeRue and Wait uh, to Member Mitchell, Middle of the Committee. My name is Hardy Millington, Web Agenda 157 District. Today I am inducing Bill, House Bill 728. This bill would draw the plaintiff to be named in a lawsuit involving the separate shirt and say. I believe it's high time that we fight for religious liberty. I love my country dearly, and I know everyone on this committee also love our country or you would not be here today. I let all join together to fight for the thing that we believe in. We lived to oppression, have been part of a nation in Missouri for a generation. From our government building, including our state capital, to our money, our motto, and our pledge of allegiance, we lived to symbol and linger our inseparable part of our history. We sent higher to a group set of freedom for religion foundation that uses a court to try to remove any type of religious symbol from public location. They all often bring the lawsuit with unknown plaintiff. For instance, in 2017, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, who were unknown plaintiff to sue a Missouri city or the trash that had been in that city park to 1930. The people of Missouri have a real interest in knowing all the fat and vent surrounding court's procedure. The defendant or identify, the plaintiff should be identified also. The case involving separating church and state should not be handled in any other way. House Bill 728 will guarantee that no individual or order Jayden will be able to use our state court as a weapon to tap the white Missouri people to display any religion symbol and put to place it or hide behind an unknown plaintiff. Are we happy to take any trading that you all may have? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Representative. I really appreciate you bringing this. Uh, I will ask the first question. So tell me, how did this, how did this come across your desk? What motivated you to uh, to draft and or file this bill? Well, uh, about seven years ago, I built a trash on my property, about ten feet, eight, ten feet tall. It said, "Get it saved." And the Freedom from Religion Group came along and somehow conned MoDOT to doing a survey to make sure that trot were my property. So I tap money, my money, your money, pay for that survey. So I think that is it. I mean, that really what? Tie, it intimidate the bill to get me to, to, to make sure that we fight for religious liberty. So every day in the country, somebody attacking the thing we believe in that we that our, our country been founded on very good i really appreciate that any questions for the bill sponsor representative hicks to inquire i'm sorry sir, you, you talked about the you talked about the uh, cross is the cross still there did you have to remove the cross i did not have to remove the cross we're talking about on my property Okay, excellent. So but what you're saying pay, is that we pay our tax dollars to have this okay. survey done. That's it, just it. So you're saying tax dollars, though. Someone made a complaint, so the tax dollars had to pay for the survey that come out. Right. Did you already have a survey? Isn't there a survey that is with the state or with the city? Yes. Oh, I mean, yes. That's been easy, easy done, but uh, they, they pay for it to be done anyway. Okay, thank you. I can support your bill. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Elbrock, proceed. <clears throat> uh, good evening. Um, you said what brought this to your attention was that you had a cross on your property and then somebody made a complaint. Did they file an actual lawsuit against you? Uh, no, sir. But they do in a lawsuit trot majority to, to a lot of other people. So traditionally, like historically, the position of the United States Supreme Court and most of the courts in the United States of America has been one of no neutrality towards religion, not to favor or not to oppress in any way, but to be completely neutral. Well, I, so I so, did agree with that concept. Well, let, okay, yeah. let me let me get my question out. I just oh, want to know. It's all right. Um, if we're specifically singling out lawsuits with regard to separation of church and state, does that, in your mind, does that maintain a position of neutrality, or does that single them out for special treatment? Well, 
I would assume that most you guys, attorney, uh, all attorney here, right? You probably don't know the answer better than I do. I'm asking your opinion, though, sir. Do we repeat that again? Okay. Traditionally, the U.S. Supreme Court and the Missouri Supreme Courts and most of the courts in the United States have tried to maintain a position of neutrality towards religion and religious beliefs in the public sector right. or in the public sphere. Does this bill stay in line with that position of neutrality by singling out these lawsuits that specifically deal with church and state, state issues? Is that a position of neutrality or is that a position that's not neutral? I think it's neutral. I think it's being fair. So by singling them out, that maintains neutrality? My opinion, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, I have a question for you, Representative. So to, to kind of move off of Representative Elbrock, because I see exactly where he's going, neutrality I think a lot of us would agree with, but what you're probably seeing is something along the lines of abuse with lawsuits, right? Yes, yes. And what you're trying, trying to make it more fair. That's right. So we're trying to eliminate that abuse to get back to that neutral position. Yes. Yes, sir. That one, exactly. I, I understand. I understand. Anyone else? Representative Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Representative. Um, do you know why someone would want to file a lawsuit uh, without their name um, present or attached to it or being the leading plaintiff? Do you know why someone would do that, would want to do that? Well, I never done that for sure, so no, would I it, do not know. Would it surprise you if the reason would be they're afraid of threats that they would get simply for filing a lawsuit? Or maybe the foundation of free religion get lying about it. Do you think that that's a legitimate reason for someone to have their identity concealed is fear well, of retribution for filing a lawsuit? Well, I'm just wondering, it, it, you were living in your hometown and you saw somebody kill somebody or whop somebody, when you go to court, are you a name out there when you testify that you saw somebody? Are you a name there? Yes. It is, right? Well, it depends. No, and always. When you see somebody, you testify against somebody, and you see somebody do something, you're a name there. The why should not be the same? Because there are instances where folks face retribution simply for filing a lawsuit. That was my question. If you thought there would ever be a reason why someone should be able to conceal their identity out of fear for the retribution they would face... Uh, to their life, to their limb, to their property, to whatever, simply because they filed a case. We never have been in, in a lawsuit, I mean, not in a, when you see something trembling done, that done every day of the week, thousand and thousand times a day, somebody is being testified that they saw somebody do harm to somebody, that they killed somebody, they robbed somebody. So what is different in that is that what we're talking about today. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Last question for the bill sponsor. Representative Tolson Reich. To inquire. Uh, uh, yes. Um, if the representative doesn't know the answer to my question, I will open it up if anybody on this committee knows the answer. So my question is, I received an influx of mass emails on the, your bill today. Right. And they come from some uh, common denominator email of P as in Paul, two, number two, a is an apple dot co. I replied to numerous people that had the same cookie cutter template email uh, being against your bill, and I said, "Well, who's who's asking you to send this? Where what does P two A dot co stand for?" And not a single person would reply to me. So, does anybody in this room know who is sending out this mass cookie cutter template emails? I call them. Uh, I would imagine the Freedom Religion Group. Anybody specifically know the answer? Yeah, I guess you. Nobody knows where they're coming from. I assume everybody on this committee got the same influx. So we're hiding behind on an anonymity here, people telling us to vote one way or the other. I, I think that just underscores your bill. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any witnesses to testify in favor? As a matter of fact, quick show of hands. How many people we have here to testify on this House bill? Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to we're going to pick one or two star witnesses in favor, and one or two tops opposed. Each of you are limited to two minutes, and the rest will come up and testify simply on the record, one way or the other. 
Mr. Witness, have you filled out a witness form? I have. Excellent. You are the first star witness. Please proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Hinkle, in behalf of the Missouri Baptist Convention. The Freedom From Religion Foundation falsely claims that the safety and well-being of plaintiffs involved in state church cases will somehow be damaged because they fear violence from people of faith. Let them name the supposed widespread violence perpetrated against their plaintiffs. Do they or any member of this committee really think people of faith in Missouri are violent people? They should be able to name a few. After all, this Wisconsin-based organization has been threatening free Missourians since at least 2016. I guess they think praying school children in Tipton are a threat because they threatened them. We're not afraid to face Caesar, and we ask you to protect our God-given First Amendment rights. These people hiding behind anonymity attack our freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and we're asking you to end their undeserved special treatment. Their plaintiffs should have been named just like any other Missourian who files a legal suit in this state. The FFRF uses intimidation by writing letters, threatening letters, and then filing anonymous, often frivolous but costly lawsuits that communities are financially unable to fight. It's an embarrassment for the state of Missouri that another organization of Satanists were able to use anonymity in their recent barbaric abortion case that the Missouri Supreme Court rightly and justly ruled against. Should the rare occasion of someone being threatened arise, then they have the same rights as we all do, and it's a people of faith. It's time for this unsubstantiated, slanderous attacks on people of faith in Missouri to stop. This wise okay. bill does not cost the state a sir, penny. Sir, your time is up. I want you and to stop take when the away time is up. Anyone's right. please, please have a seat. We've got some questions for you. Thank you very much. Que you. Questions for the witness. Representative Minton. Proceed. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, are there any other states in the country that have this as their policy that specifically segregate cases involving the separation of church and state from laws that are generally applicable to every other lawsuit filed in the state? I cannot say for certain. So but you're not aware? Know. You're just I'm, not yeah, personally yeah, I'm aware? Not, I'm not really aware if, if there is. Okay, and I'd be wonderful if somebody else that's going to testify can answer that question. Please do so. Um, and then you talked about this, uh, is it, this is impacting both your freedom of speech and freedom of religion. I'm kind of curious then why this bill only talks about separation of church and state and doesn't talk about any of the other amendments that also provide rights um, and privileges to Americans. Well, for example, uh, the Freedom From Religion Foundation has, uh, has threatened uh, the uh, Camden County simply because uh, they have two uh, pictures hanging in the courthouse, one of which uh, has a Bible verse on it, and the other, um, I believe, uh, recognizes uh, uh, what happened on 9 -11. It's a remembrance photo of 9-11. Uh, but clearly, uh, there are both freedom of speech and freedom of religion questions over those but, two but things that are this, hanging in the Camden County Court, and I appreciate that, gentlemen. I really do. But and and I apologize if I'm cutting you off. Believe me, it's I'm not trying to be rude. It's just we have a chairman that wants things to move quickly, as I think everybody in this room understands. So I guess my question, though, is that this bill doesn't address freedom of speech. It doesn't re address any of the other well, it does a, it does constitutionally a protected rights that um, that extend to any Missourian and any American. And I guess that I'm kind of curious why. Anybody that's testifying in support of this bill believes that it's okay to single out one kind of lawsuit and one kind of lawsuit only for well, it to be treated differently than any other constitutionally protected right. Why not the Second Amendment? Why not any other amendment? All I know is that they use threats of intimidation often against cities, as I said, that, that don't and, have the money to... And by threats of intimidation, you mean that they're threatening to file a lawsuit? 
file a lawsuit and do I mean it, they're not these are people, do it with anonymity. But these people which are no not, one else th in Missouri but, has to do. But they're not threatening any physical or property harm. They're just threatening to go to the courts to seek redress for what they believe is a constitutional claim. I'm not weighing in on whether or not that's a valid constitutional claim or not. I don't think that anybody could could do that. I'm just saying that you're saying that they're, you know, intimidating. I don't think that filing a lawsuit is the same as threatening somebody with bodily or property harm. Well, that's what the the officials with the city of Ozark said when they were threatened about their cross. Okay. And that's if they were here to testify, I'd be said. asking them. Thank you very much for the inquiry, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions for the witness, Representative Elbrock. Proceed. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. I appreciate your testimony, and I appreciate some of the statements you made about people of faith uh, and being nonviolent. However, uh, I have a couple of questions to follow up. Do you know who uh, a gentleman named Eric Robert Rudolph is? No. Do you know a gentleman named Paul Jennings Hill? No. Do you know somebody named Shelley Shannon? No. Do you know what the Army of God is? No. Do you know what the Nuremberg Files are? They were published by a group called the ACLA? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have nothing further. Further questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you very much for coming. I would like the next star witness in opposition. We're going to go one after the other. Next star witness in opposition of the bill. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Jane. I'm a staff attorney with the Freedom from Religion Foundation, so I'm representing the apparent villains in, in the room at this point. And I, I litigate the types of bills that, uh, the types of cases that this bill targets. Uh, Joanne Bell of Nebraska was a parent in a lawsuit challenging religious promotion by her uh, children's public school. Because her identity as a parent was known, Joanne and her kids suffered outrageous backlash while the case was ongoing. They received numerous uh, threatening calls to their home. Their, uh, the kids were called demon worshipers. They had, one of them had an upside down cross hung inside of their locker. Joanne actually had her head pushed into, shoved into a car by an employee of the school district, and ultimately their house was firebombed and destroyed. I've personally been on cases where both parents and other attorneys have been uh, subject to death threats. This is sadly not uncommon whatsoever with state church cases. This bill arms bullies with a weapon that they can turn against victims. When someone sues the government, there is a presumption that the public gets to know who that person is. Under our current system, judges can balance that interest against potential dangers to the plaintiff if their identity is revealed, so that in exceptional circumstances, the judge can allow that person to proceed under a pseudonym. This bill would strip that protective power from judges. Even if a judge knew that a plaintiff would be subject to imminent physical danger if their identity were revealed, they would be powerless to protect them. Taking this deference away from judges is both wrong and dangerous. This bill would replace judicial deference with an inflexible rule that puts real people in Missouri in danger. The bill's advocates have not demonstrated a need to take this power away from judges, nor could they. The bottom line is that this bill would lead to Missouri residents getting harassed, assaulted, and even killed even when a judge knows that the danger is there and otherwise could have prevented it. The existing system works. Thank you. Um, any questions for the witness? Representative DeGroote. To inquire, Proceed. please. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here. I appreciate your testimony. Um, <clears throat> you, are you familiar with the, the issue of uh, anonymous donors to political campaigns or causes? Sure. Okay. Um, and I just... <laughs> I always like witnesses to be consistent. Uh, would you also be an advocate for, for keeping those names on the, on the donor list anonymous as well? If a judge was considering a case with that and they had a credible reason to think that... No, no, I'm not talking about a, a legal case. I'm just well, talking about in general. Well, then it's not apples to apples. Well, I think it is, right? Because it's the same thing. I mean, sometimes people advocate or, or, or on both sides of the fence, too. I'm not just pointing at you guys or anything like that. Um, but if if they know who you're, you're donating to, sometimes... Um, Violence is threatened and, and you know, windows are broken and, and the same kind of thing that you're talking about, correct? Uh, potentially, sure. But I, uh, this bill is about... Well, not potentially. It happens. 
right? right. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, okay. a, it's, it's not a question. I, I just mean potentially. But you understand the analogy I'm making. I, I do, but I think it's, it's still kind of missing the point because the no, question about this bill is should a judge have the ability to give plaintiffs anonymity in state church cases specifically? And it, the case you're talking about it has nothing to do with judges' discretion in that area. I, so. I disagree, but I sure appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Further questions for the witness? Representative Evans. And again, thank you also for coming here. Just to clarify the law of the state of Missouri, the existing statute actually, first line reads, every action shall be prosecuted in the name of the real party of interest. Then it goes on to allow some exceptions to that general rule, right. uh, including guardians, conservators, trustees. Uh, so it's not in the current statute what you're talking about. Uh, is there a court rule that gives the judges that discretion? Uh, where is the specific law in the state of Missouri that, that allows a judge to uh, deviate from this statute? I'm sorry that I, I don't know the specific answer to that question. I, I practice in all 50 states and mostly in federal court. So um, if there is no answer to that question, then this bill is unnecessary anyway. So, I mean, that, that obviously is a practice in, in Missouri if this bill has any effect at all. And my only point is it's an important one to protect plaintiffs to give judges that discretion. All right. Thank you. Yep. Further questions for the witness, Representative Mitten. Are there any other states that have this kind of policy? I have never seen this before. I've, um, I, I, I've, I've never seen a bill even be presented that um, singles out state church uh, for special disfavored treatment in this way. And as an attorney that practices in this area, do you believe that this would be upheld by the courts as constitutional? I, I don't know for sure. Um, I, I was actually I, I was thinking about that, and I think that there is th there are certainly arguments to be made that this could be a, that there could be due process challenges to this. That if you are uh, if if a, a judge knows that you are threatened with physical harm, you you may have um, a a good a sound argument that you are entitled to anonymity in order to get your um, in order to redress your constitutional grievances. But uh, I don't know off the top of my head any um, any cases that directly support that. So the, the real and, answer is And I'm aside not from that argument, which again I think that uh, Representative Evans kind of talked kind of spoke to. Um, what about just the fact that it's only singling out one specific type of of action? Well, I mean, I, I think that that sh certainly shows the uh, the intent to stop this one particular type of cases. But um, I, it, it's such an unusual bill. I just can't say whether or not that would uh, be constitutional. Thank you. Last question for this witness, Representative Sells. To inquire. Proceed. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, an incident involving uh, a client that you had who uh, had the threat of violence. Is there are there any other instances of that? Uh, any other instances similar to that? Uh, th there are many. So I mentioned two. I just mentioned one very briefly that I was involved with personally. Um, and uh, when we uh, request one of these orders for anonymity. Uh, Something that we, we, we do, and it includes with, included with my testimony, is a, an expert who uh, declaration that goes through just myriad examples of this. So that's exactly why plaintiffs in state church ca cases tend to get this anonymity, is because when judges look at the, the history, they see that there is a, an incredibly strong correlation with uh, both threats and actual incidents of violence against plaintiffs in state church cases specifically. So that's, uh, th there is an incredibly strong uh, history of it, many, many examples. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Please remember to fill out a witness form. We are going to move back to a witness in favor. At this point, we're going to start moving much quicker. And again, I do want to remind you, please do not bring repetitive arguments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee for the record, Kerry Messer with Missouri Family Network. Uh, there are many activist organizations with far-reaching agendas, and they search for clients as well as venues. And in their search for clients, they are looking for those with the insurance companies that they can get the payout on. And they are looking for changing public policy, and they're cha looking to attack businesses and business practices. They have very aggressive agendas to change culture in general. Whether this bill is left in its current form to apply only to church state issues dealing with religious liberty or if it's expanded to all civil litigation, 
I really don't care. Uh, what concerns me is we have lots of cases of this country. Uh, we all sat very quiet watching what occurred on the House floor just earlier this afternoon. The second most, and in some people, the single most egregious decision of the U.S. State, U.S. Supreme Court was a case where an adult woman came before the court claiming she was raped, wanting to have an abortion in the state of Texas. That case went through the state the court, through all the court system. U.S. Supreme Court took away the rights of 49 states, including the state of Missouri, because no one knew who the actual plaintiff was. No one could ask, ask the questions. They couldn't reveal who, although the names were available, who advised the, the girl, the lady, to lie to say she was raped. They could never ask her whether she was telling the truth. The organization, the two attorneys that filed the suit, were never held accountable for putting down the lie in the court papers. But we now have the, the hottest political debate in our nation for the last how many decades now because of that one case. And these things go on. Religious liberty is both the original and the bedrock principle of freedom. Everything else comes from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for the witness? You, Seeing none, uh, I'm sorry, Representative Trent. Thank you to inquire. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the language as it's written would treat all claimants the same, no matter what their viewpoint was, no matter why they were bringing the lawsuit. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding. And the lawsuits that are brought uh, that you described earlier uh, to intimidate defendants uh, to uh, attack what they see as their exercise of religious liberty to change public policy. Uh, could you go into a bit more detail? Well, they, they'll do this knowing even that they may end up losing the case. But if they can win on one point, they get their attorney's fees. If they win the case, they go into deeper pockets. But what commonly occurs is they'll file the suit knowing that a, a business or an institution such as a school board, and there's, there's a school board case in Missouri that, that I'm a little more familiar with, where the school board uh, was faced with either firing the school superintendent or winning the case, except the insurance company for the school board told the school board it's cheaper to give them money and make, allow the case to go away. The end result was... The superintendent lost his job because he had a Bible on his personal desk and a cross in his personal office, just as many members of this legislative body does. The attorneys said they're going to win the case, but it's too expensive to fight, so they paid off the organization, fired the, the uh, school board member, and then the insurance company then sent notices to every school district in the state that they represented saying, you have to abide by these standards, even though they're not required by law, or we will not insure you. So that is affecting policy change without ever coming to this legislative body, and it's reprehensible. So what we have here is a strategy that uses lawsuits as a sword to en enact policy changes that they'd be unable to uh, enact in any other uh, method. And then there's a, a side financial strategy where, upon prevailing in these nuisance suits, uh, they, they gain a, a big financial payout, which they then use to pay their personnel and to bring more nuisance lawsuits and just continue, and, the, and continue no, the, the effort. I have no idea how many of these types of organizations out there, but it's easy to create an organization. And we do know of some organizations that exist for no other reason than to enrich the members of the organization. Well, gentlemen, I know in my conversation with uh, school administrators and with you know city officials and with, with other, other similar groups, uh, in, in my area, there's a lot of fear of these kind of lawsuits, and they will go out of their way uh, to try to yes. avoid them. Uh, and, I, you know, it, it seems like it's having a chilling effect on people's free exercise of their religion, far in excess of, of any legal attack that's occurring on other rights uh, in this country right now. The victimization now. on this side of these cases is uncountable. How many people are impacted lifelong because somebody sued some school board or, or some city 
over here, which set the tone for how our culture runs. Gentlemen, do you know of any chronic uh, frequent flyer plaintiffs who hide behind anonymity to bring lawsuit after lawsuit after I'm, lawsuit? I'm not that familiar to say that with Would there authority. be any way to find out if that were going on? Uh, you know, when when the actual plaintiff is not never revealed, we can't ask questions. We, the media doesn't know who to go to. Any, you know, the attorneys on the other side have no way to do discovery. So, in fact, some of, these, can, some of these cases may be bad faith. Very much so, but we can't prove it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Last question for the witness, if any. Seeing none, thank you very much. Let's go one more witness in opposition. Just as a reminder, please do not repeat the same arguments. Thank you. Good evening, members of the committee. My name is Sarah Baker. I'd like to go on record in opposition to the bill before you on behalf of the ACLU of Missouri. I won't repeat what has been said before. We agree with much of what was brought up earlier, but I would like to emphasize the point that we do think this will chill people's ability to bring forward a lawsuit if they feel like they uh, have been wrong. We've represented individuals who have been um, blocked from exercising their religious freedom out of DMV um, for failure or for not allowing exceptions for wearing the hijab. Um, we've done lawsuits across the board on this sort of issue, and we know that it can cause nervousness amongst our plaintiffs to feel like they could be chastised or outed um, to their community when they're trying to uh, make sure that church and state and the separation thereof is protected for all. Open to questions. Thank you. Brief questions for this witness. Representative Mitten. So I, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding your testimony. Basically, it, what I'm understanding is that the ACLU has represented folks who are exercising their religion or who are being precluded from exercising their religion, correct? Um, yeah, actually. So this I, isn't somebody that's saying, hey, what you're doing, these are not plaintiffs that are saying, your religion is infringing on my right to be free from such. These are suits that are saying, I am not allowed to exercise my religion, which is, is different than the first. There there are cases on both sides of that. I don't okay. want to misrepresent that. But I actually was going through this today um, and only brought one page to save your printer. But there are 29 pages of the ACLU doing cases, just like you mentioned, supporting people's exercise of religious so freedom. It's, so, so, again, this, is, this would also preclude folks that are being denied their ability to exercise their religion from filing suits anonymously. Yes. Yes. For, yeah. Okay. And then I don't know if you can answer this question or not, um, but I, I find it hard to believe that somebody that's bringing the lawsuit anonymously would not be able to be deposed and that discovery could not be had against that anonymous plaintiff. Do you know anything? I mean, I've just never been involved in a suit like that. So do you know anything about that? I would have to ask our legal team specifically. Okay. It would be those. great if you could, if, sure. if somebody could give us an answer, just email it to the committee. I think that would be awesome. Great. Thank we'll you. Do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Last question for this witness, Representative Krista Milley. Thank you to inquire. Um, thank you for testifying. Uh, I just want to clear something up, and you just happen to be the person who's in front of me right now when I noticed it, so I'm going to ask you. Uh, and uh, that is, these actions, they're brought under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, are they not? They are not brought as actions on the separation of church and state. Um, yeah, so when I was looking at that bill, I, I think they're – the, that phrase, yes, they're normally brought under the Establishment Clause saying that it's a constitutional violation. So because if we're in fact going to, if, if this law is going to do anything, we should probably change that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. At this point, we'll go back to a witness in favor, and we're going to move very quickly at this point. Any witnesses in favor? Oh, yes, sir. I'd like to speak in favor of the bill. My name is Keith Carnahan. I'm pastor of Maranatha Baptist Church in St. Robert, Missouri. I come to voice my support for House Bill 728. I believe that the inclusion of the language of this bill may aid in the reduction of frivolous lawsuits brought involving religious liberty issues. When organizations such as the American Civil Liberties Union and the Freedom from Religion Foundation represent clients who remain anonymous, Missourian, Missourians and their communities suffer. A case in point would be the city of Neosho, Missouri. The city was threatened with legal action because of a cross displayed in the city park. The plaintiff was allowed under current law to bring, this, uh, to bring the suit while remaining anonymous. Uh, such a threat uh, removes any, any possibility of the matter being resolved locally. The threat of such a punitive lawsuit is more than most communities can endure. The accusations that charge civic leaders with disregard for the U.S. Constitution, bigotry, and denial of the plaintiff's civil rights 
seem to be charges seriously enough to require the plaintiff to be named. If our civic leaders must endure the scrutiny that comes with such a suit, why should the plaintiff be excused? Legal organizations from outside our local communities, which bully our local government and school districts, should in no way enable, be enabled by state law. Thank you very much. Questions for the witness? Very briefly, Representative Elbrock. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate your testimony. Did you say you're a pastor at a Yes. Church? Okay. Um, so let's suppose for a minute, just play a real short hypothetical game. Uh, suppose for a minute we had a very heavily urban area someplace, I don't know, like maybe St. Louis City or Kansas City. I happen to be from suburban Kansas City area. But if we had that and we had a, a neighborhood in there, or better yet, slightly larger than a neighborhood, call it a school district or something that was predominantly uh, Muslim, predominantly. And even everybody that paid public taxes there, 75, 80 percent of the people that lived there were Muslim. And you had a, a, a student and parents who were paying taxes into this, and they had a sincerely held religious belief that that school district was overemphasizing the, teaches of the, the teachings of the Quran to the students uh, in that school district. And the parents brought a suit uh, under some taxpayer standing theory that is very narrowly limited, but they and they felt like their child needed to retain their anonymity because the neighborhood that they lived in, the school district they lived in, had a tendency to threaten and cajole people who didn't believe in the same faith. What this bill does would remove their ability to remain anonymous in that situation as well. Do you think that you would still support this bill if that were the case? I do believe I would. And the reason being is people are suffering, all right, presently, because of the bullying tactics of these organizations, which are largely outside of our state. I realize there are state chapters which operate. But I believe that the price of freedom does bear some risk associated with it. So does bullying tactics include shrapnel bombing the Atlanta Olympics like Eric Rudolph did? <coughs> does bullying tactics include uh, we live, we the, live. the tactics of the Army of God by sending oh. people in to assassinate abortion doctors? Do you mean that by bullying tactics? Is that what you mean? Do you mean putting up posters of doctors saying, that provide medical services yeah. to women by the ACLA, calling them the Nuremberg Files, and encouraging people to take violent acts against these physicians? I, Is that what you mean by bullying, sir? I believe, I believe those terroristic threats are against the law. Okay, there are laws on the books to deal with terroristic threats and terroristic activities. And to protect these people from further violence, occasionally anonymity might be needed to address a particularized grievance, which is what makes this different than political contributions, a, particular, a particularized grievance of a constitutional violation of their sincerely held religious beliefs. We're not talking about frivolous lawsuits. There is a standard here. The Supreme Court has established it. It is a sincerely held religious belief. And you have to meet that bar before you can even start arguing the merits of the case. What I'm saying is, from my, from my perspective, okay, lo the law as it is now, okay, which allows the anonymous suits, is not addressing the issue that we have that is rampant. I follow all of these cases, okay, closely. I'm not saying I follow them in detail, but I follow them closely. And they exist across the country where communities are denied the ability to have jurisdiction over their school districts, okay, uh, over uh, city government. For example, our county, the officers have In God We Trust on the bumpers of their car. That is offensive to some people, right? Okay, we're going to need to wrap it up here. Okay. Thank you for the Thank inquiry, you. Mr. Chair. Thank you for coming. Anyone else in favor? Any other witnesses in favor of the House bill? Very, very briefly, please. To go on record, Bev Allen with Concerned for America, and there's two other individuals that could not be here from Camden County. Thank you. I would like to expand it to letters of intimidation as well. Thank you very much. Anyone else in favor? Seeing none. Anyone else in, in opposition of the bill? Come on up very, very, very briefly. Just as a simple reminder to please fill out a witness form. Please turn on your microphone. There is a push button there. Not your fault. There you go. Is this working? That's working. Okay. 
sorry. Um, my name is Scott McKellar. Uh, I am an atheist, not afraid of burning in hell, but I sure as hell am afraid of uh, self-appointed Christian warriors worshiping a God so feeble that he requires assistance from thugs. Now, most Christians would never think of the, these sorts of things, uh, never do them, and I'm not trying to tar anybody with a broad brush, but it only takes a few. It only takes one. And in uh, establishment clause or, uh, type cases that are pu well publicized, there is almost always at least one. The result of this bill, and presumably its intent, would be to silence religious minorities, such as my own, through the threat, the implicit threat of extrajudicial retaliation, possibly including violence or other illegal action. HB 728 is a brazen and cruel attempt to replace the, law, the rule of law with the rule of the cudgel. It is an abomination. It must not stand. Thank you. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for coming. Anyone else in opposition? Come on up. Please fill out a witness form. There we go. Chairperson Gregory and uh, uh, fellow representatives. Uh, my name is Eric Wells uh, with the American Atheists. And um, some of you had asked about some specific examples in which um, people had been harmed with uh, uh, anonymity being missed or lost. And so I have some examples here. And I think these are the people who were uh, suffering uh, just as, if not worse, than some of the folks that uh, were, other, that were uh, alluding to earlier. So Joanne Bell and Lucille McCord, as the FFRI attorney had uh, mentioned earlier, their house was firebombed because they objected to school prayer uh, and Gideon Bibles being passed out. In 2010, Rhode Island high school student Jessica Alquist faced severe harassment at school and numerous death threats because she stood up against an unconstitutional religious mural at her school. Two families, one Catholic and one Mormon in Santa Fe, challenged unconstitutional religious coercion by their schools in 2000 including chastising ch children who held mer uh, minority religious beliefs, proselytizing during school, permitting a distribution of Bibles at school, et cetera, et cetera. In 2011, a Texas family that challenged the unconstitutional practice of prayers at school graduation, as well as the judge who heard the challenge, received unrelenting harassment and death threats throughout the case. U.S. Marshals were required to provide continuous security detail in order to protect them both. Lisa Herdahl received death threats after challenging prayer to Children's Public School in Missouri, or in Mississippi. Other parents even threatened their own children with, beating, with beatings for playing or even talking to those children. The Dobritz family challenged their public school's practice of permitting teachers to proselytize and distribute Bibles to non-Christian students. They were driven to move to another country due to, due to anti-Semitic taunts and threats. Thank you for your respectful testimony. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for being here. Anyone else to testify in opposition? Hi, I'm uh, Chad McLaurin. I'll be representing the Secular Coalition for Missouri, uh, State Director. Uh, a lot of these cases... Um, obviously are kind of our purview, um, talking about separation of church and state, religious freedoms. Um, that extends to a, um, a lot of people. For example, you have a lot of minority religions, as was brought up earlier. Um, so it's not even about the religious versus the irreligious. It's about what is the popular opinion at that point in time imposing its will on the body at large. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think there's been like a lot of disingenuine uh, discussion about what some of these things are. Um, for example, one of the mischaracterizations I would like to bring up there, somebody brought up um, a case that's kind of uh, – 
what, what I kind of built my case around, which is Mary Doe versus Greitens that just recently was um, dismissed through the appellate court system like a matter of weeks ago. And as far as the nefarious doings of these um, organizations and their willingness to go out there and just pester God-fearing Christians every day and just harassing them, um, really what was at stake here was the individual, a young woman who was, I, I forget exactly how old she was, but quite young, already a single mother, was unemployed, moving to Missouri, and had left a relationship that she needed to seek um, a different location from. She gets to the state, and Missouri, a lot of the religious interests are so far up women's uterus in terms of their interest in abortion and how we regulate this, that she had very little option other than to seek somebody who would help her out in that case. The Satanic Temple in this case resonated with her, that was the organization that stood up and actually helped her with the legal fees, with the counseling, and things necessary for it to bring her um, case to consideration. I think every single one of those is a very valid point. This is not a matter of just frivolous lawsuits. I mean, the rest of us have jobs. We don't just do out there, go out there and raise um, havoc for, for fun. Um, but in this particular case, um, anonymity is absolutely essential. <clears throat> if we want to look back to the NAACP in the 1950s, uh, State of Alabama requesting membership, anonymity was their one protection. And it's true of many cases. Okay. Any questions for the witness? To inquire. Come on back, have a seat here, sir. Proceed. I, I just want to follow up. The okay. case that you used as an example, are you familiar with that that woman has um, disavowed her association with the case? Oh, I'm quite well, yeah. I, I just think it's interesting that you used it as an example quite violently. Um, when she herself no longer wants to be associated with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May, may I respond to that? No, you may not. Okay. Next question. One last question, Representative Mitten. Thank you. I can, are, are you an attorney or not? I couldn't. No. Okay. So I guess then I can't ask you if you're aware that uh, the defendant does get to know who these plaintiffs are, these anonymous plaintiffs. It's just not available to the general public. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. And what is your response to the earlier question? My, my response to that question is that she had a falling out with the organization that she entered into good faith with. Thank you very much for coming. Any other witnesses to te testify in opposition? Seeing none, anyone here to testify for informational purposes only? Seeing none, this concludes the hearing on House Bill 728.